When I was a little girl, my parents gave me this personal tape recorder here. Probably most of you have never even seen something like this. It's a bit antiquated at this point. Uh, you know, for a child that may be an, an odd gift, but for me, really, it was perfect. Because for as long as I can remember, I've always loved telling stories. So I, st I went through this phase when I was about eight years old that I started telling made-up stories to the air and walls around me. So my parents gave me this recorder so I could keep them for posterity's sake because, you know, they're my parents, so they're proud of me no matter what I do. <laughs> so you can see that storytelling and experiencing new, new perspectives, new cultures has always been in my blood. It, it speaks to my heart like nothing else can. And so it may not surprise you that when I went away to college, I decided to major in journalism. But then, I was overwhelmed with encouragement by well-meaning adults to pursue a sensible career. And I took their advice to heart, and I switched my, my major, and without realizing it, a part of me died. After I graduated from college, I just wanted to run away. I was, I was tired of doing what other people told me was expected of me, what, what the sensible career option was. So I went to South Korea for a year. I went to teach English to about 450 high school girls. And unexpectedly, a part of me came back to life. This year in South Korea ended up being the most transformational year of my life. And I did get to travel a lot, which was beautiful and, and wonderful and eye-opening and enriching. But what really made my year so special were the people I met and the stories that I heard. There's that theme of my life popping up once again. So you'd think by now I would have gotten the message, but you know, sometimes we have a hard time learning the lessons that we need to learn. So after my year in Korea ended, I came back to the States and settled down into a sensible career. I was in this job for about a year, and this year contrasted sharply with my time in Korea. While that had been the best year of my life, this was undeniably the worst. I had no passion for my job. I felt dull, disinterested, and stuck. A great day at work for me is one in which I didn't cry by the end of the day. Another part of me had died. Now at this point you may be wondering why? Why would someone ignore what they know they love just to do what other people tell them they should do? Or perhaps you're not wondering. Perhaps you can relate. A Gallup poll released in March of last year said that of the approximately 100 million full-time employees in this country, 51 percent aren't engaged at work meaning they feel no real connection to their job. Another 16% are actively disengaged at work, meaning they actually resent their jobs. They gripe and complain and bring down office morale as a result. That's a total of 66% of the full-time working population in this country. Look around on either side of you, the two people closest to you. This means that of the three of you, Two of you don't like where you spend the majority of your lives. Take it one step further, another, another survey released by Gallup in November of last year said that globally, 85% of workers worldwide don't enjoy their jobs. That's roughly the entire world minus India. That's the staggering. So obviously, I'm not the only person who has pursued a career based on something other than passion. But why do so many of us do this? Why do we ignore our heart's passion to do things that are soul-sucking rather than life-giving? Well, I think the answer is something we can all relate to. It's fear. Do you remember that transformational year I told you about in South Korea? I left out one tiny little detail about that. I was absolutely terrified to go. I spent every night for weeks leading up to my departure crying myself to sleep. I did the same thing when I went over to college. In fact, every single transformative event in my life, travel, marriage, college, new jobs, new careers, writing a book, even giving this very presentation, every single transformative event has been preceded by lots of fear before I took the plunge. Can any of you relate? Well, I think if we're honest, we can all relate to feelings like that. 
But you know, sometimes the scariest and even the worst things in our lives can end up being the best things for us. When I was in that job that I mentioned earlier, I had, I had fallen into a deep depression. But it was as I was in that depression that I was able to look back and see what I had been allowing to happen in my life for so long. I had allowed others to silence the truth of who I knew I was and replace it with a lie. With many lies, in fact, with lies that said I needed to be in a certain industry or look a certain way or have a certain skill set or make a certain amount of money in order to be successful. I've known my whole life that what makes me come alive is telling and hearing people's stories. Yet I had ignored that fact because it wasn't a sensible career option. And every time I ignored that, a part of me had died. But being brought so low made me realize that I didn't want to run away from my fears anymore. I knew what made me come alive. And, and, I wanted, and I finally started to ask myself how I could stop running away from what scared me and actually make it a reality. So I created a blog and started telling stories full time, um, helping people find the, the meaning in their lives. And it was exhilarating, and a part of me came back to life. But while it was a growing and stretching experience for me, after two years, I still wasn't able to turn a reliable profit. And so in short, my greatest fears were realized. I had pursued what I was passionate about. I had tried to do something that excited me, and I had failed. But it was because I failed that I succeeded in the end. Statistics vary, but, but surveys say that between 50 and 90 percent of small businesses fail within the first five years. These are commonly cited statistics. What are less commonly cited is that failed entrepreneurs who open a second small business are dramatically more likely to succeed. In fact, with every subsequent failure, their chances of success increase. Best-selling author and entrepreneur Robert Kiyosaki said that there are two types of, of people who fail. The first, the first is people who are so afraid of failure that they freeze and do nothing. The second is when they haven't failed enough. Many people succeed up to a point, but then they stop. They stop growing, they stop learning, they stop failing. And eventually, they plateau and begin to die. So you see, failure is ubiquitous with success. You cannot have one without the other. Madonna dropped out of college. Oprah Winfrey was fired from her evening reporting job because she couldn't sever her emotions from the story. Elvis Presley was told by a concert hall manager that he would be better off driving trucks than singing for a living. J.K. Rowling was a single mom living on welfare before she penned the Harry Potter series, which is now the best-selling book series in history. Albert Einstein was expelled from school. Marilyn Monroe was told that she should pursue a career as a secretary rather than a model. Steven Spielberg was rejected from film school three times. Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team. And my personal favorite, Walt Disney, was once fired because he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. <laughs> so why did all of these people succeed after failing? Obviously, all of these people have succeeded. It's because failure causes you to think differently. And that's the same thing that happened with me. After I had experienced this failed blog, I started to think differently. And I knew that I, I loved culture and I loved meeting new people. And I started to think, well, how can I do that while still staying connected to my life here in the States? And so I decided to bring the world to me. And I started hosting through Airbnb. 
Airbnb, for those of you who don't know, is an online marketplace for hospitality services. It allows people to rent and lease short-term accommodations, and you can rent anything from a castle in England to a yurt in the woods in your backyard and everything in between. So my plan was to do this part-time on the side as a way to meet new people and, and pay for new adventures. But it wasn't long before this became much, much more than a side gig to me. I had stumbled back into my heart's passion, and I was fully alive again for the first time in a very long time. Night after night, I would have complete strangers walk into my room and tell me their stories, tell me what made them tick. I remember there was Kendall, the, um, who had struggled with addiction and depression and told us about these struggles on the night that we met her. Or Charles, the elderly Indian businessman who chose to stay with us rather than with his colleagues at the Ritz-Carlton. I still haven't figured that one out yet. I can't forget the, uh, I remember the, the garrulous French couple who told us all about their, their um, new business endeavor. And of course, I can't forget the trio of Colombian exchange students who stayed with us all summer, affectionately referred to by my husband and I as uh, the Colombian invasion. They definitely did invade, <laughs> but it was in the best of ways. By allowing these strangers into my house, I had tapped once again into the things that spoke to my heart. And I, had and I had become alive again. Eventually, I started doing this full time. I, um, I created a website, Airbnb Made Simple, and I help people learn how to host their spaces and, and welcome people into their homes. I also wrote a book, The World in Your Living Room, because that's, that's kind of the theme of what I do here, to tell stories about the people that I've met and address common fears that have come up over and over again. It's been a crazy ride, and I still fail all the time. I fail every day. But I learn from it, pick myself up, and I move on. Michael Jordan once said, I have missed over 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost nearly 300 games. On 26 occasions, I have been entrusted to take the game-winning shot, and I have missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. If you're one of those 66% of Americans who aren't satisfied with your work, perhaps it's time to think about why. Could it be that your terror of failure, your fear of disappointing others, is keeping you from realizing the passions of your heart, from finding your true potential? It took my life crumbling apart, falling into a depression, before I realized that I wasn't where I wanted to be. Don't wait that long. Stop being a spectator to your own life and start pursuing the things that scare you, the things about which the thought of failure sends a cold shiver of fear down your spine. Do those things because those are the things that you care about. Those are the things that matter to you. We're all afraid of failure. You're not alone in that. But we often forget that there are only two types of true failure. There's failing to try and failing to learn from your mistakes. Anything other than that is simply courageous preparation for your next success. So be brave, have courage, and experience the freedom of failing, the freedom of pursuing your fears. Thank you.